American Pale Ale brewed with nugget and cascade hops with an ABV of 5.5%. It's hoppy but smooth and clean, and today's beer was brought to us by, first up, thanks to Sean from Hawkeye Country. And a big shout out to Allison from Kingswood, Texas. Next up, it cheers to Jake and Jenny in Lehigh, Utah. A big we like you jib to Caitlin in Washington, D.C. Next up, a huge thank you and cheers to Chris and Krista in Bismarck, North Dakota, And last but not least, we have Zoe right here in Columbus, Ohio. So thank you to everybody that went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fun. While you're on the website, make sure you sign up on the mailing list. And that's enough of the beers, Niels. All right, Captain, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Well, obviously, Captain, we cannot tell the story of each and every individual victim in this case because, as we will learn, there will just be too many of them. Now, a list of all of the names of the known victims of Dean Coral is available on his Wikipedia page. But here are some of the stories of known victims. The first victim may have been Jeffrey Allen Conan, age 18, a student from Houston. Jeffrey hitchhiked from Austin to Houston with a friend who last saw him getting out of a car at Voss Road around 6 p.m. This is on September 1st, 1970. His body was later found at High Island. According to record, neither Brooks nor Henley participated in this murder. And then there's this report from Wayne Henley that states one day he and Coral were out in the van parked in front of a grocery store when a boy came along on his bike. And Coral called the kid over and told him he found some empty Coke bottles while cleaning out his van. He would give them to the kid just to get rid of them, and the boy could take them into the grocery store and get the deposit and keep it. Do you want to explain to the listeners what this means? Because there's some listeners that are out there scratching their heads right now going, why would this boy want empty soda bottles from this strange man? Well, because when you turn them back in, you, there's a deposit amount. Mm-hmm. So you get, I think, a nickel for each bottle that you'd return. Yeah, and it might have been more back then, or, or or at least the nickel was at least worth more back then. And the idea being that the, the soda companies had to reuse these bottles. So it was an enticing way to get the people to return the bottles to be reused and probably get you to buy some some more soda because you go to the grocery store and then they're handing you money. Right. So after the boy comes out of the store, Coral calls him back over and he says, Hey, look, not only did I give you those bottles for free and you just got money for them, but come to think of it, I found a lot of bottles in my garage when I was cleaning it out. And Hey, you could put your bike in the back of the van and you could ride home with me and get these empty bottles and sell them and keep the money. Well, that kid got into the van with Coral and Henley, and Coral took him home. The boy's name was James Dremela. He's age 14. Later that evening, James called his father, Douglas Dremela. Yeah, he calls his father because he's going to ask him, hey, is it okay if I spend the night at this party that's happening across on the other side of town? His father says no, and he wanted the boy to be home in 20 minutes. Well, he never saw James alive again. David Brooks later said that he bought James a pizza and hung out with him for about 45 minutes before, quote, Dean went to work on him. Dean Coral tortured, raped, and strangled the boy. Well, we should also talk about Frank Aguire. He's a, he was a local teen. Frank finished his shift at the Long John Silver's restaurant and told his mother that he would be home by 10 p.m. that night. Now, he never showed, and he was never seen again. This is because Brooks and Henley, who were acquainted with Frank, called him over to their van asking if he wanted to go smoke a joint with them at their friend Dean Coral's place. Mm -hmm. 
So he followed them there in his vehicle and once in the apartment was bound, gagged, raped, and murdered. Well, just think about how sick and twisted the minds of Brooks and Henley are, right? Right. Because they've seen what Dean can do. And to invite your friend over that you know to yeah. be like, hey, come smoke some pot with us. You are, you're the bait. One thing that I wondered about too regarding this story specifically, because so many of these stories, people end up getting into the van or somehow arriving over at Dean's Coral's apartment to go to an, a, a quote unquote party. Mm -hmm. But this story specifically mentions that this boy, Frank Aguirre, drove his vehicle to the apartment. Now, we can assume or, you know, at least at least think that maybe Frank Aguirre is one of the bodies that would be found in that boat shed. Right. My question is, this vehicle, we've discussed this on this show many times, that a lot of times a vehicle can be more of a nuisance for a killer to dispose of than a body. Right. And I couldn't find any reports of stating, hey, this kid's still missing, but we found his car here or found it there. Uh, no mention of this vehicle. Now, obviously, what we do know so far in this story, Captain, is that some of the motivations for the murders of these teenage boys conducted by Dean Coral and now what we believe one or two accomplices, especially for Dean, these motivations would be sadism, torture, mutilation, Mm -hmm. amongst other things. And we should discuss some of this, but I do want to be clear here. We really wanted to minimize this portion of the discussion of the, the physical torture that Dean Coral actually inflicted on his victims, not only because the details are stomach turning, but because the families of these poor boys have suffered enough hearing the fates of their loved ones. And in fact, most of the families could not manage to sit through the court proceedings that would come later because they were just too horrific. Right. And this information is widely known on the internet. If you really want to dive into it. Yes. And in order to convey just how monstrous and evil Dean Coral was, we do unfortunately need to get to some of the facts. What would happen is Coral would get the boys into his apartment and somehow incapacitate them. We mentioned some different things here. It seems to me, captain, that he had two different M.O.s. And I think what we have here is before he had his little accomplices, Dean, you know, David Brooks and Wayne Henley, right. who would later help him. I think his original M.O. was, you know what? I'm going to get some teenage boys back here. I'm going to let them party. Maybe it's one boy. Maybe it's two. I'm going to get them drunk, let them smoke some stuff, let them huff some stuff. And the way that it was described later by Wayne and David Brooks is that during these party times, Dean would kind of sit back and, and let the teenagers really go at it, let them really party down while he right. was just kind of waiting. And these are also, uh, let's just assume that these teenagers are not, they're, they're probably not drinking often, they're probably not smoking this much pot that often, probably definitely not huffing this paint. So we're talking about really getting these guys incoherent. Yeah, and I think for at least before he had Wayne and David Brooks helping him, I think the whole M.O. was to let these kids kind of party and wait till they pass out. And once they pass out, well, I can tie them up, put handcuffs on them, strap them to the torture board, whatever. Right. You know, I'm he's in control at that point. And then I think the M.O. changed a little bit once he had the accomplices. And I think that was for a couple of reasons. Like you talked about earlier, Brooks talked about how Dean moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you'd think that Dean would want to be out like in the middle of nowhere. So just in case they did wake up and scream or whatever, because there's actually no reports of people hearing things that I could find. Right. Actually, the, the things that I found, according to Brooks and Henley, were that often Dean Coral would tape duct tape the mouths closed of the victims. Right. And he would leave the duct tape on. I guess on a couple of occasions he took it off because he was sick enough. He wanted to hear the screams, but he would, when he would do that, he would turn up his stereo system all the way so that, you know, neighbors on the outside, all they ever heard was, was the stereo Loud music. Yeah. I think what's 
uh, what's what's shocking and I think what's changing too when we talk about his MO, I think once he had the help of these two teenage boys, I think Dean was kind of spiraling out of control in the sense that he was he would get a little sloppy because now he has these kids bringing so many kids over to his apartment. Right. Where I think at, I think before it was more difficult for this grown man to talk a teenager or two or three to come back to his apartment. Now, once you have somebody that they know, you know, somebody that they've talked to, mm-hmm. they're the ones doing the inviting, not this, not this 20 something, 30 something man. Right. And so I think it was easier for a lot of potential victims to enter his home, his residence. And I think that, made him lose a bit of control in a sense that I I think he wanted to kill a lot more than he actually did. Again, this is years before technology of cell phones and and things like that. So once you had them in your house, there's no way that they could connect with the outside world. Mm -hmm. And I think the handcuff trick um, was something that they started doing because he could get the boys, his accomplices to talk the other boys into doing this handcuff thing with them. Right. And I think it was a way of Dean. Look, this is his drug. Unfortunately, sexually assaulting, torturing and killing these teenage boys is what he is addicted to. That's why he ended up doing it so many times. Right. And I think what we see here is in the old days, he had to sit back and wait and let the kids party until they would pass out. And I think once he had the help of these two teenagers, he no longer could wait. Mm -hmm. He couldn't just sit back and wait. He couldn't stand to wait an hour or two or three for the kids to pass out. Instead, he had to incorporate this handcuff game so we could get to this this terror as soon as possible. Right, for but Dean. it all escalates anyways because you're you're paying these teenager boys to perform sexual acts on you, and that's not enough. Okay, so now we have to escalate it to uh, tying them up. Now we have to escalate that to. Well, we don't want them to be as drugged. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's the escalation. And I think, especially with the handcuff trick, it was once once they realized, I think he kind of got off on the idea of once the, the victim realized, I, I'm stuck. This was a bad mistake. This was a trick to get me into this position. Right. I think he got off on, on seeing that fear. Right. Well, regardless of how he incapacitated the victim, once they were incapacitated, it was all over for the victim. Coral would then strip and strip and strap them to that torture board where he would then rape and torture the victim. He would on occasion keep these boys alive for extended periods. Some of the tortures included castration, large object penetration, chewing on the genitals, or using a dull knife on them, electric shock with exposed wire, inserting tiny glass rods into the penis, and then breaking them with his fist or a hammer. The boys died from either gunshot or strangulation. Another torture device that was used were the wooden boxes that were found. Remember, they had air holes in them. Mm -hmm. It was reported that these boxes were used to imprison the kids and torture them. Uh, when asked why Coral killed the boys, Henley told police it was because Coral wanted to have sex with them, but then they resisted. Of course, you and I know that that's probably, there's probably much, much more to that story. Right. And of course, the boys were often forced to write letters or to call home telling their parents that they had left or that they were in another city. Now, I said that we were going to not go through all this stuff in detail and minimize the torture in the discussion of it. I want to be clear as gruesome as all that stuff sounded, we did minimize what is actually reported in right. this. Now we should talk about the bodies because there were more bodies and Henley and Brooks were asked to make lists uh, when they were being questioned by police of every boy that they could recall that ended up being a victim. Mm -hmm. Henley at this point volunteered some more crucial information and he stated that more than just the boat shed, there were other burial sites. Apparently Dean Coral's father owned or rented a cabin up at Lake Sam Rayburn. 
and some of the bodies were buried nearby. Mm -hmm. Henley accompanied investigators to the Lake Sam Rayburn area. After getting his bearings, he showed them a spot in a heavily wooded area near a dirt road and to another area about half a mile away down the dirt road. Each of these sites contained bodies, one of which he recalled was Billy Lawrence. The next day, Henley led them to the same wooded area and showed them another grave site, which he said contained two bodies. All four of these bodies showed signs of extreme violence. Investigators searched the cabin that Henley and Brooks said Coral used on occasion. There they found several items of interest, including another torture board, shovels, a sheath of plastic wrap, rubber gloves, and a sack of lime. More intriguingly was a hand-drawn map, which according to the local sheriff appeared to be of, quote, possible new grave sites, end quote, mm -hmm. pinpointing several areas in the San Juan Quinto National Forest in southwest Texas. What's interesting here, though, Captain, is there is no indication in the sources available that any kind of investigation was done pursuant to the map that was found. Uh, meaning... But Meaning, they didn't do like digs. They, they didn't go look for anything that was on that map, even though we have the local sheriff publicly stating that they are quote possible new grave sites. End right. quote. Then there was finally uh, one last burial area. Henley directed investigators to an area on High Island near Galveston and told them that six bodies uh, that he knew of were scattered up and down the beach. Now, this took a massive effort, but eventually a total of six bodies were, in fact, found. Curiously, accompanying the two bodies were an extra arm bone and an extra pelvis bone, indicating the likelihood of at least one other unknown victim. Right. All in all, police recovered 27 bodies of young males from three burial sites. The top forensic pathologist in Harris County emphasized that identifying all of the victims would be very difficult. They had no definitive list of names to work with here, Captain. So the big question here with 27 bodies of young males buried in three different sites is how did he get away with it? How did Dean Coral operate right underneath authorities' noses, plucking boys right out from their own neighborhoods, often in broad daylight? How did this go unnoticed for years? Well, on top of that, it's like there are missing kids right? that it seems like they're not following any of those leads. But then you also have this individual that nobody even suspected, really. No. And they thought he was a nice guy. They uh, thought he right. was an upstanding citizen. He was a he was a guy that was always employed, always seemed to have money. The only thing that would seem weird on the outside is that, you know, a lot of neighbors that he had over the years said, the man did hang out with a lot of young quote hippie types mm -hmm. referring to the teenage boys that he was hanging out with. One thing that I found very strange amongst all the other strange things is all in all 20 of the victims were associated with the Heights, with that neighborhood right. uh, being either from there or from an adjacent neighborhood. Now the Heights itself is only about two miles by three miles. So a tiny area. Right. And so, and get this eight boys were killed between June 1st and August 4th of 1973 alone. And five of them were from the Heights. What I'm getting at is that nobody seemed to observe a pattern of teenage boys disappearing from this very specific area at an alarming rate. Right. You would think at some point there'd be curfews and don't go anywhere without your buddies. And the fact that Brooks is involved and Henley is involved these are high school aged kids. Yeah. So you, again, that's now June. So we could assume they're out of school at that point, but well, they were both dropouts, so they didn't right, really right, care right. about school too much. Well, but what I mean by that is they're still at the age where you think there would be rumors started. Oh yeah. About one of the, one of the two guys. I think ultimately he was able to get away with so much because not only was Coral outgoing, friendly, funny, considered neat and even witty. Right. It's, it really helped that Coral was in the company of Henley and Brooks. 
I think that the the kids, the boys in the Heights uh, area, they knew both Henley and Brooks, and they felt comfortable hanging out with this man that was a longtime friend of these two teenage boys. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing, though, too, is, and this is reflective of the time, okay? And I don't want to get into this long argument or debate about homosexuality versus pedophilia. They're two, Nick understands they're two completely different, separate things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Homosexuals, good. Pedophiles, bad. Mm -hmm. Nick gets that. So when I, when I state these things, Nick Nick also talks in third person. Well, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, that I'm down, you know, that I'm being rude to any community other than the pedophiles. Right, right. Because I, I'm no at no time in my life did I ever believe that the two were connected. Right. You know, there are heterosexual pedophiles and homosexual pedophiles. And by most accounts, Dean Coral was both homosexual and a pedophile. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what I'm getting at here though is in the early seventies and in Texas, that would have raised red flags on its own, just him being homosexual. Right. Another thing that I think helped him get away with so much stuff was it wasn't known that he was homosexual, right? Not to the adults. It, Betty Watkins was his girlfriend by, from what most people thought Right. that helped him as well. And you made that noise earlier when I described her two sons, who knows what evil plans he actually had in mind for her sons. Who knows? Maybe he sought her out or sought somebody out that had boys that would eventually mature into an age that he was, attracted to which happens often yeah but 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 also it in a way since she is technically she's just a Mm cover-up they're not intimate so one could argue that's not even a real relationship so she's a cover-up but the fact that she has boys of a little bit older of age that's a cover-up too you know Mm -hmm. it's like oh well well yeah he's he hasn't done anything to them right so therefore you know Uh, He doesn't do anything bad to anybody. And the thing here, though, is while the adults in the neighborhood and the adults, the parents of a lot of the teenagers that Dean Coral hung out with didn't know that Dean was homosexual, Mm -hmm. the kids did. The teenagers that hung out with him, it was later reported that it was, quote, an open secret amongst the area youths that Coral would pay for oral sex And in fact, many of the kids engaged in what they called gay for pay with Dean Mm Coral. And what I'm getting at is when we're talking about how did some man so evil get away with such horrible stuff for so long, that's when you, you sit there and you read these stories and you piece them together and you're going, man, if somebody somewhere, there was people that had thousands of red flags, right? There were so many red flags. If somebody just would have said something to the right person at the right time. Maybe some of this could have been avoided. Maybe they did though. I mean, this is also, I mean, we live in an age right now where everybody's kid is freaking special and they have to have uh, a name that was made up, you know, Moonflower. You know, nobody has common names. This is back in the 70s where there was a million Steves uh, Mm -hmm. and a million, you know, Nicks and, 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 parents just didn't listen to their kids as much so there could have been these rumors happening there could have been conversations that they had with their parents that they just uh, brushed aside and any one of these rumors or allegations could have stopped a lot of this well and one thing that i would point to that was so disturbing and so just mind-boggling is that we had dorothy hillegeist the 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 mother She tells police that, hey, I heard a rumor that that my son may have gotten into a GTX vehicle Mm -hmm. and there's a GTX vehicle driving around my neighborhood and here's the license plate. And that was never, never looked up. Nobody bothered to look that up to see that it was. Or they did look it up. Or they did and and saw the name and didn't care. Right. And they go, oh, he's he's upstanding citizen and his family owns a candy factory. Well, obviously, Captain, the public outcry about the Houston mass murders brought to light many of the missing boys' parents' frustrations with the fact that police mostly ignored their pleas for help. Now, granted, in that time period, there were no computers at the police department that would have alerted 
officers to the number of missing boys. There were no Amber alerts being broadcast that would have set off alarms with the public. No internet connecting missing kids' parents with other parents in the same boat. Well, and also, when you have a missing 15-year-old or 16-year-old or 17-year-old, this is a different time. This is a time that people got done with high school and they either went to college or they started a life. They got a career. They were married by 18, 19. So you're talking about not that far away from being an adult. So there was probably a lot of runaway situations as well. There was, though, a complete lack of recognition that there was a problem here. I mean, this is this simply indicates an extreme police incompetence or at the very least disinterest in these missing reports. Yeah, have- I agree, but I also kind of disagree because I like you said, with the technology, they don't know. They don't know that there's mass kids missing. Yeah, that that's all I'm saying. I I don't want to throw them under the bus and say they they just just didn't do shit. Well, parent after parent came forward and blasted the Houston police for their tunnel vision that the boys were simply runaways. And the rebuttal, police chief Herman Short met with the press after the bodies were found. He said his department was underfunded and could not possibly look into the over 50, sorry, the over 5,000 annual cases of missing kids that were reported in Houston and stated uncategorically that any claims that Houston PD had dropped the ball on looking for missing kids was on untrue. Now, of course, in some of the cases, a portion of the blame does lie with the parents. And according to chief short, some of the boys who corals would end up being corals victims, they were never even reported missing at all. Right. In some other cases, one could probably make an argument that the parents were not paying much attention to what their sons were doing. And, they should probably know the whereabouts of their children and the company that they kept. Or maybe just report them missing. Well, and the sheriff concluded by saying that he planned a department crackdown on hitchhiking. This likely because Wayne Henley, in an interview right after the discovery of the bodies, told the media, you've got to warn these kids against hitchhiking. That's how we picked up most of them. Listen up. If you're a smoker and you're trying to quit, or if you know someone who is, there is a revolutionary new way to quit called Zero. Zero's Quick Kit is a new quitting solution proven to increase your chances of kicking the habit by up to four times compared to going cold turkey. I quit smoking years ago, and I'll tell you what, I tried the cold turkey approach several times. Didn't work for me. You can't do this alone, in my opinion. Zero is the thing that could get you over the edge and help you finally quit smoking. The Zero Quick Kit is a three-tiered approach that includes prescription medication, nicotine gum, and a continued support through a mobile app. Here's how it works. Go to quitwithzero.com to start your online doctor visit. After your five-minute visit, a physician will then determine if you are eligible to use the Quick Kit. If you're eligible, the doctor will prescribe your medication and the quick kit will be shipped directly to your door. Zero costs less than the average smoker spends on cigarettes and less than most other quitting options. The Zero Quick Kit is normally $129 per month, but for a limited time, my listeners can get their first month for only $79. Go to quitwithzero.com slash garage to quit smoking. That's quitwithzero.com slash garage. Support for today's show comes from Thrive Market, an online marketplace that's on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. You'll get access to thousands of best-selling organic foods and natural products at 25 to 50% below traditional retail prices. Whether you're vegan, gluten-free, or feeding a family, you can find everything that you need with Thrive Market. Choose from organic almond butter to lavender essential oil. Thrive Market carries everything you need. They have pantry staples, cleaning products, sweet treats, and the best snacks, and much, much more at such an affordable rate. For every paid membership, a free membership is given to a low-income family or a public school teacher or military veteran or first responder. I love Thrive Market. They are my go-to 
for organic cooking supplies, and I love the snacks. They have the best snacks. The inventory is impressive. The speed of the delivery is very fast, and the prices are very good. And the website is very easy to use. And now, with my special link, Thrive Market is giving you an extra 25% off your first purchase plus a free 30-day trial. That's 25% off the already low prices that Thrive Market offers. Just go to thrivemarket.com slash garage to access this discount. That's thrivemarket.com slash garage to access this discount. In 2013, Amy Arrett founded Madison Reed. Named after her daughter, the company is on a mission to revolutionize the way women color their hair. For decades, women only had two options, outdated at home hair color or the time and the expense of a salon. Amy created Madison Reed because she believes that women deserve better than the status quo. And ladies, you are going to look your best with Madison Reed because they have reinvented the way that women color their hair by offering the quality of salon color but the convenience and affordability of at-home hair color. You're going to look like you just came from a salon, but the reality is you had more me time to do the things that you really love. Experience beautiful multidimensional hair color. It's made in Italy, delivered to your door on your schedule for under $25. That's right, ladies. You could treat yourself, and it's trick-or-treat time, so... Why not treat yourself for under $25? But you don't have to take our word for it. You can join the hundreds of thousands of women who have tried and absolutely loved Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. And Madison Reed would like to honor True Crime Garage listeners with 10% off, plus free shipping on your first color kit with promo code GARAGE. That's promo code GARAGE. Check out madison-reed.com today. Madison Reed, treat yourself. Cheers, mates. Cheers. One of my favorite movies, and I think, well, I don't know if it's one of your favorite movies, Teen Wolf. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I love calling people dick noses. It's my favorite movie. No. The favorite movie of all time. <laughs> no. I was actually thinking uh, for like non-scary Halloween movies, I was thinking about that the other day, mm-hmm. and Teen Wolf would fall into that category for me of like top 10 movies that just aren't scary. You, they're not meant to be scary. But right. would be good Halloween theme movies. It's definitely a Halloween movie. I, I feel you on that one. Yeah. But one of the scenes is Styles and Michael J. Fox and Styles is looking for his weed and he has a shirt that says, What are you looking at, Dick Nose? And I just think that's hilarious. So I made them and they are going to be available for pre order in the store for the next week and a half or so. Now nobody ever do this. They say, don't try this at home. I say, don't try this anywhere. Okay. Um, But my favorite scene when I was a kid that I thought was the coolest thing I had ever seen when I first watched Teen Wolf for the first time, there's a scene where they're car surfing and I, somebody, is it Styles? Uh Is he standing on top of the car and they're driving and he's pretending to be surfing Surfing. on the car as it drives? Don't try that anywhere. Wait, wait, my my favorite scene is at the end of the movie when they win the game or whatever, spoiler alert. Oh, wow. (laughs) Is in the background, uh, a gentleman stands up from the bleachers and it's in the background and you can see him zip (laughs) zip up his pants. I don't know why that cracks me up every time. The center on the basketball team is my favorite guy on the team. All right. A Harris County grand jury was convened. Regarding these cases, principal witnesses included Tim Curley and Rhonda Williams, who presumably testified to the events of the night of Dean Corll's death in August. Mm -hmm. Another witness came in with a grocery bag over his head to hide his identity. Squares cut out so he could see. This was Billy Rittinger, whose life Brooks claimed to have saved. Now, we don't know what Rittinger testified about, We can only imagine that he suffered terrible and traumatic sexual abuse at the hands of Dean Mm Corll before being released. But if Rittinger would have gone to the authorities at that time, again, another situation of who knows how many boys could have been saved, but he didn't. And perhaps Mm -hmm. Dean Corll had some kind of hold over him, or perhaps he was so deeply ashamed that he couldn't bring himself to tell anyone. Right. 
Now, the grand jury wasted little time indicting Henley and Brooks. After six hours of deliberation, it returned true bills against both boys. All in all, they both received multiple indictments. Efforts by defense attorneys to get the young men freed on bail failed, thank God, and a psychiatric uh, evaluations were ordered. Henley was not charged in the murder of Dean Corll, but he was charged in the murder of others. Right. Then 12 grand jurors who indicted Henley and Brooks for mur- murder went off the grid and issued an explosive report that criticized the police and the district attorney saying their investigation left unexplored the possible involvement of others and related criminal activities in the course of pre-trial hearings, some very interesting new information emerged. Dean Coral kept keys he collected from boys whom he entertained at his home. Mm -hmm. Police found 75 to 100 keys. I couldn't get an exact number because it it varied. Lowest number I found, 75. Highest number, 100. But they found somewhere between 75 and 100 keys in a box at the Lamar Street home where he last lived before being shot. Henley stated to investigators that one of Dean Corll's motivations for retaining the keys of his victims had been that he would subsequently burglarize their homes. Mm -hmm. So this is where my mind jumps to. Did he, did Dean label each key so he would know which key would match up to which house? house? Right, right. Yeah, because you can't just go up to a door and then fumble through 75 keys looking for the right one. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Henley and Brooks, they were tried separately. At the trial, Tim Curley testified to what happened on the night Henley shot Dean Coral. He said his life was saved when Henley killed Coral. Of course, his life would have never been in danger in the first place if Henley hadn't delivered him right to that apartment. Now, Rhonda testified as well, but she did so behind closed doors because, keep in mind, she was still a juvenile at this time. Mm -hmm. Billy Rittinger testified as to what was done to him after being lured by Henley and Brooks. The prosecution called dozens of witnesses and introduced 82 pieces of evidence, including Coral's torture board and one of the boxes used to transport the victims. A Houston police chemist testified that Henley's hair was found on a discarded clothing of one of the victims and in one of the plywood boxes used by the trio to transport bodies. His hair was also found on a device used to torture the victims before they were killed. Mm -hmm. Henley's attorneys did not put up much of a defense, and Henley did not testify. His confession was accepted as solid evidence against him. It was read in full to the jury. The jury found Henley guilty on six counts. He received six consecutive 99-year sentences. His accomplice, David Brooks, received one 99-year sentence. Did he say, so So you're saying there's a chance? There's a chance if he can live 100 additional years. In Henley's case, the prosecutor said in his closing arguments that he apologized for not being able to seek the death penalty because the case was the most extreme example of human of man's inhumanity to man that he had ever seen. Yeah. Henley's requests for parole have been denied. There is no question that Wayne Henley and David Brooks deserve to be punished severely for their roles in the abduction, torture and deaths of 27, 28 boys. But one has to question whether the two would have received the same sentences if Dean Coral was still alive. Right. He would have assumably taken the brunt of the legal justice. And perhaps Henry Henley and Brooks would have then been seen less culpable in mere boys who fell under the influence of the dominance of this monster. Well, they're definitely victims. But well, they're right. Vi- right. They're victims. But again, this is this is also the weird terminology as far as sex trafficking. Some people just view it as that you um, you you kidnap somebody that that you sell them to a different place and they go into hiding. No, part of sex trafficking is is having control over an, an individual in their community. Yeah. So essentially, this would fall under those terms. 
you know, yes, they helped with those crimes, but they helped those crimes under basically being held hostage uh, on some level. But, but at what point do you, you, you have to understand that they're victims and you have to, you know, you have to sympathize with that part and they probably never would have done what they did if it wasn't for Dean, but they, at what point, how many victims at some point you have to say you are responsible for these actions and, and, and face the charges. This is one of those rare cases where the, where one person, two people are both victim and monster. It's very rare that you see that, but this is a prime example of a case where somebody is both the victim and the monster. Just like you said, how many times until you stop being the victim and you become the monster? Right. And, and and again, there, there might've been something in Dean's past where maybe he was tortured by a older gentleman. That's possible. But again, you can't, um, you can't have some kind of trauma that happened to you when you're younger and then go and murder people. And then it's okay because you were a victim first. And I actually, you know, I throw that question out there of would their sentences have been less I think we have a situation here where there was no death penalty at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that how much more severe Dean Coral's sentence could have been. Now there would have been a chance that they may have needed both boys to testify against Dean Coral. And maybe that would have helped create a shorter sentence for either boy. However, I think if I think without Dean Coral being dead, Mm -hmm. I don't think any of this comes to light. Meaning I think in some weird way, both boys feared and felt protected by Dean Coral at the same time. And I think this confession that started with Henley only really came about because he shot and killed Dean Coral and he was forced to talk to police about that specific incident. Of course. And, and the, the, it's very odd here because if that girl doesn't get her mouth free, if if she is not able to talk Henley into helping her, you know, so therefore she is, you know, a hero on some level, but on some level Henley's a hero because he he did put it into this and there was enough humanity left in his brain to, to stop this Mm -hmm. at some point. One thing we haven't talked about, but we did mention that it was going to be extremely difficult was identifying all of these dead bodies. Of course, identification of all of the bodies found would be extremely difficult. Most of these kids had never been fingerprinted and they were decayed by the time that they were found. Right. Many of them had no dental records. There was of course, no DNA testing at the time either. Now the number of deaths Coral was blamed for would fluctuate as authorities tried to determine who all these bodies were Mm -hmm. one of these complicated identification situations arose just a month after coral was shot. The Wardrop family identified and buried their two sons, both victims of coral. They buried their sons in a graveyard in Atlanta on Friday, September 7th, 1973, the Waldrops received a shocking telephone call that there had been a mistake. The two boys that the Waldrops took back from Houston and buried in Atlanta were not their children. Mm. There had been a mix up in the identification and the wrong bodies were sent to Atlanta. An official in the district attorney's office said that the bodies buried in Atlanta were those of Molly Winkle. I'm sorry, Molly Winkle and David Hillegeist. Nearly two weeks after the discovery of the terrible mix up, the body exchange was accomplished. Now, By the time of Henley's trial in 1974, 21 of the bodies were positively identified, but the body of John Manning Sellers was controversial. His body was one of the six found on High Island, but it didn't fit the pattern of the other bodies attributed to Dean Coral. Mm -hmm. First of all, the corpse was clothed. The others were found naked. And this was found several miles down the beach from the other five victims. And Sellers was killed with a high power powered rifle. Whereas the other 26 were either shot or strangled shot with the 22 mm-hmm. Sellers was reported missing on July 12, 1973. 
His burned-out car was found in Starks, Louisiana a week later. The medical examiner testified that he did not believe that Sellers was one of Dean Corll's victims. So this could possibly take the number of people killed by Corll to 26 and not 27. But Sellers is listed as one of Corll's victims on most lists. On Wikipedia, they have Dean Corll's list at 28 plus. So meaning that he might have more than 28 victims. Well, then, Captain, there is an individual named Mark Scott. In 1994, more than two decades after the murders, the medical examiner's office presented the Scots with remains that they said they believed were Mark's based on early versions of DNA identification. The family had the remains cremated and placed in a family crypt at Brookside Memorial, but were not still convinced that they were given the right boy. The medical examiner's office kept a single bone from the remains. Sharon Derrick visited the Scots and took a DNA sample from Mark's brother, Jeff. In what she would later describe as one of the saddest moments of her career, she returned to the Scots' home and told them the DNA from Jeff's swab did not match the DNA that came from the bone. The conclusion was inescapable. Mark was somewhere else and was not the body lying in the family crypt. Do we know where Fahmy Malik was at around 74? During 74. I mean, was he in Texas? Because That's a good this, question. This has Fahmy written all over it. Yeah, because Boys on the Tracks was what, 80, 86, yeah. 87? Yeah. Well, it's thought that Mark's remains are probably still at High Island on the beach. Remember, um, we talked about how difficult the search was for the bodies there. Mm -hmm. And we also need to point out too, that eventually later, um, this whole area was submerged partially underwater during hurricane Ike. So because of that, and because, because of the original difficulty factor, I've got to believe that unfortunately, I don't think Mark will ever be found. Right. The boy whose remains were buried in the Scott family crypt turned out to be Steven Sickman a 17-year-old last seen walking down West 34th Street shortly before midnight on July 19, 1972. Sickman's mother reported her son missing shortly after his disappearance, but police were unwilling to conduct a search for him, telling the mother that the youth was 17 years old and that unless they found a body, there was nothing they could do to assist her. Sickman, of course, was murdered by Coral and his henchmen. Right. By the late 2000s, amazingly, three sets of remains still remained unidentified. Sharon Derrick, a forensic anthropologist, has made it her mission to identify the last of Coral's victims. Good for her. Well, she, go ahead. Last of what was dug up, because we do have this map, but they didn't do digging. Yeah. And and look, if, if we have, we have this guy that carries out the MO constantly, pretty much the same. You know, maybe he'll teeter totter on. Well, I'll shoot him this time and not strangle him this time. But the MO is most often the same. So then we have evidence that this guy has 75 to 100 keys of possible victims. So on Wikipedia, you put 28 plus. Well, that's there's a lot more than that. It, and I'd say the number is probably between 75 and 100. I, I bet you regarding that map that they found at the cabin, you're probably talking anywhere from three to half a dozen more victims just on that map alone. Right. That are never going to get any justice. And there could be as simple as was there a missing person, you know, reported in this family and was their house at some point was something stolen from their house. There wouldn't be any break in, but just right there would be enough evidence for your family to go, this missing person that we never saw again possibly was a victim of Dean. Well, more regarding Sharon Derrick, who I think is one of the few heroes in this sad story. Mm -hmm. um, eventually she was and has been in contact with all of the families. And, you know, these are people that believe that their child may have been a victim, but whose body has not been found. So she has pursued all of the missing persons reports filed 
in the area between 1970 and 1973, one thing not done by the police, as well as others sent to her by parents of missing boys. In 2008, 37 years after the murders, one family finally got closure. Sharon Derrick showed a photo of a facial reconstruction of an anonymous victim to David Brooks, who was sitting in prison. Brooks stared at the photo and said he didn't know who the boy was, but he knew how he had died. He drew a map of an intersection in the Heights, Shepherd and 13th Street, and he pointed to a particular corner where the boy had lived. Sharon Derrick realized that that was the home of a boy who disappeared in 1971 and whose frantic mother filed a missing persons report two days later. This was Randall Harvey. He was only 15 when he left to ride his bike to a gas station. His body was found in the boat shed. His mother had died, but his sisters were overcome with the news that they had finally identified his body. In 2010, two writers who were working on a book about the case raised a question about the date of death of the boy who was buried as Michael Bulch. They noted from the police and autopsy reports that the boy buried as Michael was found largely skeletonized, suggesting that he had died in early 1972. But Michael didn't go missing until July of 1973. The medical examiner obtained a DNA sample from another Bulch sibling and ran it against the DNA profiles belonging to the two unidentified bodies in the unmarked grave. The test revealed that one of them was, in fact, Michael Bulch. The problem was, of course, Michael had been buried alongside his brother, Billy, in Woodlawn Garden of Memories Cemetery years earlier. So who was the body buried in the grave labeled Michael Bulch? The medical examiner had a list of names, possible victims called from missing persons reports in the area at the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 2011 that the boy buried as Michael Bulch was finally identified. After exhuming the remains and conducting DNA testing, he was identified as Roy Bunton. Roy left work in a shoe store in the Northwest Mall and never was seen again. Bunton's family feared that he was one of Dean Corll's victims, and they provided a description of him to the medical examiner, but they were never able to identify or find him because he was buried with incorrect identification. Now, this only leaves one victim remaining unidentified, and he remains so to this day. This is a victim who has been called the swimsuit boy because he was wearing a brightly colored swimming trunks when his body was found. Okay. He was also wearing an unusual T-shirt with a peace symbol on the back and what appears to be some kind of military lettering on the front and cowboy boots. He was five foot five inches or maybe five foot six inches tall and he had brown hair. There is a reconstruction of his face. It has been made available online. Sharon Derrick says she believes Swimsuit Boy likely came from the Houston area. Now, we have our thoughts, Captain. We've been talking off mic about this case a little bit. Um, would we like to throw some of our thoughts on here? Because the first thing that I think about when I think of the story of Dean Coral, the, the candy man, mm-hmm. was... And that's why I included some of those more well-known names in the trailer, Gacy, Dahmer, and so on, is that Dean Coral, he's not as well-known as some of these other monsters, but he's mm. simply equal to all of them. He's He should be feared and hated as much as, as all of these others. And in fact, one thing you and I kept kind of coming back to is that he and Gacy shared very similar MOs yeah. on many different levels. It's almost like the same MO. Right. And, and and really, you just wonder, because this happened early in 70, was Gacy reading about this going, hey, that, that makes some sense. Let me do that. Yeah. And even just the fact that they would both, let's take the killing out of it completely. Let's take the handcuff trick out of it completely. Just the fact that both of them were attracted to teenage boys and had the idea of, well, let's, how about I just party with them? How about I invite them over to my house and let's feed them some beers and, 
and drink and smoke pot and stuff like that. On both of them, there's some evidence that shows that both of them could have been involved in sex trafficking of these young boys. And did Dean get these ideas or Gacy get these ideas because they're from different areas? Now, Dean was was actually born in Indiana, which would have been close to Gacy. Yeah. So is there some connection as far as sex trafficking where they got these ideas from people they possibly were selling victims to? Well, and unfortunately, and I've said it here before, and I'll say it again. Unfortunately, these serial killers, they learn from one another. They do study one another. Mm -hmm. And specifically, there was a killer that was interviewed by John Douglas. And John Douglas says, hey, I brought up the idea of, did you read about serial killers? And he said the killer looked at him like he was a moron. He said, look, man, you growing up, you read the backs of baseball cards studying stats. Right. He goes, same thing I did, but I didn't care about baseball. I I cared about killing even at a young age. I was reading about these killers and learning what to do and learning what not to do so that I could get away with it for longer. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get to some of the aftermath of this whole thing. So Dean Arnold Coral was laid to rest in August of 1973 in a quiet 15-minute service at Pasadena's Grandview Memorial Park. This is going to sicken all of us. Remember, he did serve in the military for a very brief stint. So Mm -hmm. the American flag was removed from his casket and given to his father before the casket was lowered into the grave. He did receive a military burial. A sunset United Methodist church reverend conducted the services among the small group of relatives and friends at the quiet burial were half a dozen members of Coral's immediate family, including his mother and his grandmother. The Coral story isn't talked about much in Houston today. Now we have Mary West, Dean Coral's mother. She continued to exhibit denial even 20 years after the fact, telling the Houston Chronicle that she believed that Wayne Henley and David Brooks actually did the killings. And she thinks that Henley should have stood trial for murdering her son. Tim Curley, who survived Dean's torture board, after being delivered by Wayne Henley as fresh meat, gave his only, his one and only interview to a Houston television station in 2008, saying, quote, I have two choices, either accept it and move on or kill myself. According to a close relative, Curly spiraled downward after the interview, drinking heavily and suffering from his own form of post-traumatic shock. In March of 2009, Curley died reportedly of a heart attack. He was 55 years old. Now, as we've pointed out, us plus some in in law enforcement do think that there are more bodies out there, but law enforcement have resigned themselves to the likelihood that they will never be found. So remember all of those missing persons reports that came into the juvenile division of Houston PD you have to wonder, did some of these individuals run into Dean Coral? That's when you ask yourself, how many more could possibly be out there? Mm-hmm. Now, whenever Henley and Brooks applied for parole, the parents of all of their victims were forced to relive the horrific murders as they wrote letters to the state parole board objecting to the release of the men who killed their sons. Finally, in 2015, a law was passed allowing the parole board to limit parole requests to every 10 years. Brooks will be up again in 2028, Henley in 2025. What a sick bastard. I'm never eating candy again. Yeah, everybody be safe. On your trick or treat night, everybody be safe. Make sure there's no razor blade.